21st of October, 1966, the day before half-term, at the Pantglas Junior School in the village of Abavan, near Merritha Tidville, South Wales. The children had just settled down for the morning attendance register. It was only a half-day at school that day. No doubt the children were excited at the prospect of a week off, a whole week to play out with their friends and not have to worry about homework or getting up early every morning, a general air of good mood all round. As the clock ticked over at 09.15, a huge roar was heard outside, rumbling like thunder, a rumble that could be felt through the feet, growing ever louder. Some looked out the window to see it was. The jet plane, perhaps? Excitement soon turned to sheer terror, for the roar grew louder and louder. The school building shook around them, the lights flickered, and then there was blackness. In the blink of an eye, the Pantglass Junior School had been buried beneath a landslip of choking, semi-liquid mix of black dust, mud and slack. Immediately, the locals sprang into action. Civilian and professional rescuer all scratched around frantically with bare hands through the debris, only to be met with the lifeless bodies of their community's children and their teachers. Nearly an entire generation wiped out just like that. What the hell had happened? How could a disaster be so cruel to have snuffed out the lives of so many young boys and girls? The locals knew exactly who was at fault. They'd been warning about it for years now. It had finally come true. Today, Descent into Darkness takes a deep dive into the world of corporate manslaughter, negligence, obstinate denial and corruption in Abavan, The Day Innocence Died. Nestled in the valleys of South Wales, the cosy coal-mining village of Abavan was one of many such communities dotted throughout the country. Coal had been a massive industry throughout Britain, and in the industrial era, no coal was more highly prized than Welsh steam coal. This black gold helped feed the monstrous steam engines, both static and locomotive, that kept the heart of Britain ticking. For these small communities, the local mine was the main employer, Generations of young men followed their fathers into the dark recess of the mine. It was backbreaking work, hot, sweaty and dusty. They faced constant threat of pit collapse, spontaneous fires and pockets of poisonous gas. And when they retired, the men were at the mercy of the coal miner's disease, pneumoconiosis, commonly known as black lung, from the years of inhaling coal dust. The much-loved Welsh folk singer Max Boyce, himself having worked underground for nearly eight years, wrote this poignant line in his song, Do It's Hard. But I can't forget the times we've had, the laughing midst the fear, cause every time I cough I get a mining souvenir. By the 1960s, however, coal was very much on the decline being taken over by oil, electricity and gas. Following the Second World War, the entire coal industry was nationalised to help shore up the economy. This was called the National Coal Board, or NCB. British coal mining has traditionally necessitated the deep shaft technique, ooh, misses, as opposed to the more modern idea of open cast mining. Deep shaft mining leaves the least impact on the surface, but requires a lot more in the way of manpower. It is also a lot more dangerous. Coal is found in in a relatively thin layer called a seam, the general area where the action happens being termed the coal face. The tunnels created underground are the result of constantly chasing the seam further and further down. Originally, it would have been extracted by hand tools such as picks and shovels, although later, as technology advanced, a mechanical machine that looked and operated pretty much like a gigantic chainsaw was introduced and greatly improved productivity, a move that is always going to keep the mine owners happy. The subterranean labyrinth that is created consists of very narrow, claustrophobic passageways. Sometimes the coal face itself has very limited room to manoeuvre, even as far as workers needing to either squat, kneel or lay down to access it. The mining of coal creates a lot of waste. This is from the rock that surrounds the seam. 
This is sifted out and essentially dumped nearby. This waste is called slack. It consists of a combination of larger rocks all the way down to what is essentially fine dust. This dust is known as tailings and can, under the right conditions, almost flow like water. The dumping areas themselves are called tips and over the many decades of a pit's existence, these tips can reach many hundreds of feet high. In Abavan's case, they implemented a small narrow gauge railway to take the slack away to the tips. Towering over Abavan were seven tips. The last and most recent one was closest to the village. At near 111 feet high, it is thought to have contained around 297,000 cubic feet of slack, 30,000 of which was tailings. The NCB had met to discuss the problem of drainage in the area in early 1965 after complaints were lodged from the borough council, specifically about tip number seven. By the time of the slip, no action had been decided upon. The entire previous week of the disaster, Abavan had experienced an utter deluge of rain. It had rained virtually every day. Around six and a half inches had fallen in the preceding three weeks to the disaster. In fact, that entire year had seen an unusually heavy rainfall. As usual, the British propensity to complain about the weather was no doubt present. Another detail which the NCB did not want to make public knowledge was that tip number seven was dumped right on top of a natural water spring. This combination of torrential downpour and the underground springs were having an unforeseen effect many metres above the village. It was slowly turning the artificial mountain into liquid sludge. In the early hours of the morning on the 21st of October 1966, Tip 7 slipped about 10 feet or so, creating a large sinkhole into which a section of the narrow gauge plateway had collapsed. This was discovered at 07.30 and reported to supervisors, but the only action they decided upon was to consider the location of a new tip to begin next week. An hour and a half later, the rest of the tip finally gave way. It ran down the hill in a wall about 20 to 30 feet high, heading inexorably toward the village at nearly 20 miles per hour. The first obstacle in the way was the Pantglass Junior School. At 09.15, the black wall of slack hit the school with a deafening roar. The children and staff inside stood absolutely no chance of escaping. The windows and doors caved in as hundreds of tons of choking slack filled each room like water. Many would have literally drowned in the sludge. The remaining slack flow lost its momentum as it filled the nearby streets and houses. When it finally stopped, a large section of the village was nowhere to be seen, buried under the dark earth. Almost immediately, the entire community turned out to assist in the rescue efforts, most not even having any tools, just using their bare hands to frantically dig away at the slack and sludge, many of them with panic in their minds. The lives of their own children were at stake. As the word spread, men, women and materials poured in from the surrounding areas, and a temporary mortuary was established at the local chapel. As the rescue efforts progressed apace, the deafening sounds of people hurrying to and fro would suddenly be punctuated by whistles, whereupon everyone would fall silent. A rescuer had ordered the whistle, as they thought they could hear something from beneath the slack. The quiet was needed to try to accurately locate them. As the morning wore on, the number of survivors found became fewer and fewer. There were no more survivors found after 1100 hours. Just the dead. It would take a week to find every victim. The press descended on the tiny settlement in droves. Not all of them were exactly sympathetic. One rescue worker recalled overhearing a journalist asking a little girl to cry for the camera. On the 23rd, a detachment of the Territorial Army arrived to assist in the clearance efforts. These were soon reinforced by sailors from the cruiser HMS Tiger and soldiers from the Royal Border Regiment. The next day, a coroner's court was opened. The purpose of a coroner's court is merely to officially establish the cause of death. The coroner ruled that all the victims of the disaster had suffered accidental death, to which the outcry was immediate. One man clearly shouting, No, sir! Buried by the National Cool Board! On the 27th of October, 
a mass funeral took place at Brintaf Cemetery. There were 81 children and one woman buried that day, attended by nearly 10,000 people. A huge outpouring of solidarity, sympathy and respect. The coffins were lined up in two long trenches. To see so many tiny coffins must have been a truly harrowing moment. The body of the last victim was finally recovered on the 28th of October. This brought the final total to 144. 28 adults and 116 children. The very next day, the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh arrived to pay their respects and to observe the clearance efforts. One notable absentee from the disaster was the chairman of the NCB, Lord Robbins. Instead, he preferred to attend a ceremony that would see him made Chancellor of the University of Surrey. When he did finally deign to get his ass down there, he maintained that no one at the NCB knew of the underground springs. Despite them being clearly marked on Ordnance Survey maps dating from before the time of the tip's construction, A tribunal was set up and had its first public meeting on the 2nd of November 1966. The board spent five months gathering evidence. In that time, 136 witnesses gave testimony. The then local MP, Stephen Davis, stated that whilst he was truly worried at the prospect of such an event occurring, he dared not speak up for fear of the mine being closed, which would have had a dire impact on the community by taking away the major employer of the area. The NCB were adamant that the disaster was entirely a natural one, a classic act of God defence. The rain was to blame and nothing else. The NCB couldn't control the weather after all. Fortunately for the families of the victims, the tribunal was not buying that load of tosh. The board concluded that they had a strong and unanimous view that the Abervan disaster could and should have been prevented. The report which follows tells not of wickedness, but of ignorance, ineptitude, and a failure in communications. Ignorance on the part of those charged at all levels with the sighting, control, and daily management of tips. Bungling ineptitude on the part of those who had the duty of supervising and directing them, and failure on the part of those having knowledge of the factors which affect tip safety to communicate that knowledge and to see that it was applied. Much of the time of the tribunal could have been saved if the National Coal Board had not stubbornly resisted every attempt to lay blame where it so clearly must rest, at their door. Almost as soon as the news of the disaster broke, a relief fund for the families was set up by the mayor of nearby Merthyr Tidville. This fund attracted donations from all over the world. Over 90,000 individual contributions, along with 50,000 letters of condolence, brought the fund up to 1.75 million. Today, that would be nearly 420 million. Of course, no amount of money can possibly begin to replace the loss of a child, but of course, it can certainly help to heal wounds. However, the fund controversially became embroiled in legal problems. In a series of moves that have been the topic of much criticism and debate ever since, the government's own Charities Commission initially stated that the amount payable to the families should not exceed the paltry and insulting sum of £500, around 12000 today. The managers of the fund did manage to argue that the commission up to £5,000, but even then, this did not even come close to being morally fair, given the amount in the pot. Some of the fund managers felt that most of the money should be used to both benefit the wider community and move the remaining tips. This, even though the tips were entirely the making of the NCB, who absolutely should have been the ones to shoulder the entire burden of moving them. And here is the part, dear viewer, that will make you very angry, as it did me. The Charities Commission even had the audacity to threaten the trustees with removal if they attempted to pay any monies to the families of children who were recovered uninjured, even if they were suffering emotionally, which many understandably were. Many surviving children suffered with night terrors, a newfound fear of the dark, complete social withdrawal, refusing to sleep alone, PTSD, and most sadly of all, survivor's guilt. 340 children were affected by this callous decision. 
There were even rumours that the bereaved families were to be investigated to find out whether they were close to their children or not, with a view to using any excuse to basically cheat them out of a payout. Outrageously, the fund paid out £150,000 to the NCB to pay for the removal of the remaining tips. What is even more disgusting was that this money was not paid back to the fund until 1997, and even then, not adjusting for inflation. The NCB themselves offered a meagre sum of £50 to each bereaved family, around 1200 today. One can only imagine the nightmare that befell the poor victims of Abavan that day. The closest approximation in my personal experience was during a trip to Pulf Maur, or Big Pit, near Blanavon, around 19 miles from Abavan. During our trip underground, we were asked to briefly turn out our headlamps. Trust me, guys, you have never experienced true darkness until you are several hundred feet underground and the lights go out. Even though I knew that all was well, the complete deprivation of light was nonetheless an unsettling experience, and I didn't have several hundred thousand tons of earth bearing down on top of me, choking the air from my lungs and crushing my body. For a child, this fear effect must only be greatly amplified. Decades on, the disaster is still keenly felt by the community of Abavan. There is still an understandable seething resentment at the way the people were treated, especially when it came to the way the relief fund was mishandled. The National Coal Board, whose fault this absolutely was, almost became a swear word. One of the survivors said many years later, There was none of the discipline we used to have. We didn't go out to play for a long time because those who had lost their children couldn't bear to see us. We all knew what they were feeling, and we felt guilty about being alive. The mother of one of the children said, People all over the world felt for us. We knew that with their letters and the contributions they sent, they helped us build a better Abavan. A clock recovered from under the spoil was frozen in time at 0913, running around two minutes slow, but still a reminder of the tragic moment that it all happened. The cynical amongst you, and I most certainly am one of them, will not be surprised to hear that absolutely no one from the NCB was prosecuted for this disaster. Not even the corporation itself would be answerable, and not even any demotions. The NCB were able to spin the narrative in their favour at every step of the way. The chairman, Lord Robbins, did tender his resignation, but only after a backdoor communique assured him that it wouldn't be accepted. At the very least, there is a case of corporate manslaughter that will, unfortunately, forever go unanswered. The Merthyr Vale colliery was finally closed in 1989, no doubt a victim of Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher's policies, but at least the tips were cleared, regardless of how it was paid for. Her late Majesty Queen Elizabeth II would confide in her private journal and to confidence that she deeply regretted not coming to Abavan much sooner. At the time of the disaster, she was a mother herself four times over. I'm certain that she would have been keen to show her solidarity and sympathy to all the families that lost their young ones, and to be the beacon of hope that she represented. She did, however, return to Abavan in March 1973 to officially open the Abavan Memorial Gardens, which stands on the former site of the school. The outline of the walls remain to show where the classrooms once stood. The Queen visited Abavan on many significant anniversaries since. Her long-standing involvement has been dramatised in the Netflix series The Crown, Season 3, Episode 3. To actually see a visualisation of the very moment of the disaster itself and the harrowing drama of the aftermath has been done with the utmost respect in their treatment of it. I thoroughly recommend. One day, I would dearly like to make a trip to pay my own personal respects. Astoundingly, today, there still exists a staggering 2,456 spoil tips remaining just in Wales that have not been cleared. Of that number, 327 are classified in the top two most dangerous categories, 71 being in the highest risk. If these tips are not cleared, it is only a matter of time before we see more Abavans. Just take a moment, dear viewer, to think about that. I truly hope that every effort is made to prevent this from happening, but it will require that most difficult combination of factors, money 
and willingness. I must admit that during the research for this video I felt a growing sense of moral outrage and anger as I read the details of the disaster fund scandal. Only a truly cold, heartless bastard would ever entertain the idea of using money that was given in good faith to help the bereaved families to remove the remaining tips, let alone bog the fund down in any legal wranglings. I found myself having to come away from this script and jump on to other projects to give myself an emotional break from the story, and I say this as a person who has not yet been blessed with children. But all I can say, in final tribute, is Gorvoisuch meon heith, blant abervan. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you found it informative and entertaining, despite the highly serious subject matter. Please like and subscribe for more. Feel free to comment your thoughts on Abavan, especially if you have any further information to share. I'm always looking to learn more, as, in my opinion, a day without learning is a day wasted. In the meantime, look after yourselves, and I will see you on our next descent into darkness.